off, we finished Hamlet's to be or not to be speech. And he says at the very end of that, Ah, the fair Ophelia. Nymph in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. What are orisons? Prayers. Prayers. So is he saying, Ophelia, when you pray to God, remember all my sins to him, like God, and remember Hamlet did this, and he did this. What's he mean? Pray for me. Pray for me. Why? Because I'm a sinner. So, she says, Good, my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? Why does she ask him that? Have you been for the last several days? <clears throat> she hasn't seen him. That's the implication. Okay? What did her father tell her to do? Cut off all communication. So, Hamlet says, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. I have some remembrances of yours. And she pulls out from somewhere these tokens. Okay, now these aren't what she's reading. She's reading a book. So maybe she has stuffed them, like all this crap, inside the book. Anyway, she pulls them out and says, um, take them back. I never gave you anything. Uh, you know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath, Compose has made the things more rich. Words of so sweet breath. How did thou, those words of so sweet breath make the things more rich? What is she saying about those tokens she's giving back? In... Uh, what's the word I want? in contrast to what Polonius said about them. Polonius said they were what? When she first tells him about these tenders of Hamlet's affection. <coughs> Anybody remember what he says about them? Tenders. Springs to catch woodcocks. In other words, they're brokers. They are traps used to do what? to win your affection. Well, it's really more than her affection that Polonius says Hamlet wants. Okay? She is telling us here she doesn't believe her father. She is saying these were sincere. You really meant this. Their perfume lost. What's the perfume? The sweet breath that composed them. Why has the perfume been lost from the letters? And it's not that, you know, he's gotten a bunch of polo cologne and smeared it all over. That's not what she means. Though, that is the idea. Okay? It was common then to perfume your letters. Okay? But how does the sweet breath by which they were composed become lost? What did the ghost... Looks different now. Okay, is it that Hamlet's different now? What did the ghost tell Hamlet not to do in his revenge on Claudius other than don't touch your mother? Remember, I used this board as an example. Don't taint your mind. What has happened to Ophelia's mind about Hamlet? It's been tainted. By whom? Two people, her father and her brother. What have they told her? He doesn't really love you. He just wants to get you in bed, period. Okay? That's why these items lack the power and force they once had. She now thinks you're just like every other blanking man. That's all you want. You're a pig. Okay? Their perfume lost, take these again. Why? For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. She's saying, I see through you now. You lied to me. You don't really love me. 
And so she gives them. Are you honest? Now, why does Hamlet ask that? It just hit me. I've been teaching this play for 30 years. I think it's at that moment Hamlet realizes she's, quote unquote, part of the resistance. She's on the other side. She has gone against him too. So, are you honest? My lord, are you fair? Mean, meaning beautiful, not meaning even-handed. Are you, you know, are you for justice and all that kind of stuff? But are you beautiful? So, are you honest, true? Okay. Are you beautiful? She's like, what are you, what are you getting at? I don't, I don't understand. That if you are honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Look at your footnote, 108 and 109. Your honesty, your chastity. Your chastity should do what? Should admit no discourse to your beauty. That is, to be familiar dealings with your beauty. You shouldn't use your beauty, in other words, for what? To damage that chastity. Okay? Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? She's thinking beauty and honesty as kind of virtues, ideals. Well, shouldn't beauty go with honesty? After all, Plato you know, with whom we've talked about several times. Plato said, if you're beautiful on the outside, guess what that means? You are beautiful on the inside. That's why, go to Shakespeare's sonnets. That's why we want to see fair things increase in the world. And we want ugly things to die out in the world. Because if you're ugly on the outside, it also means you're <coughs> ugly on the inside. So she's saying, don't you want beauty and honesty to kind of go hand in hand? Hamlet, try truly. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty. And I think, you know, part of what Shakespeare's doing here is they're talking like this. Hamlet's using honesty in one sense. She's understanding it in another sense. Maybe he's using it down this way, and she's using it in a higher sense. I play with that how you want. Truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is. Now is he talking honesty, truthfulness, honesty, chastity, to a bod. What's a bod? B-A-W-D. Procurer of flesh, a madam. It's not a pimp, because a pimp is usually male. It's a madam, a woman who sells other women. Will transform honesty from what it is to a bod. Then the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. Then the force of honesty, whether that's truthfulness or chastity, can transform beauty into its likeness. That is, can make it like itself. So beauty, according to one meaning of honesty, should be what? Chaste. What does chaste mean? Pure. Pure. So you can be, quote unquote, chaste and have sex. How? Within marriage. In the traditional Western, you know, Christian kind of frame of thinking. So, Hamlet says, force of honesty can translate beauty into likeness. This was sometime a paradox. What's a paradox? What does it, how does a paradox at first appear? Like a contradiction, right? Virgin mother. Huh? Hot cold. Sweet sour. Silent scream. How can those be true? Paradox is different from an oxymoron. An oxymoron appears to be contradictory. Closer exam examination, it is true. 
Paradox takes that a step further. Okay? You gotta really look at it to see the truth of the seeming contradiction. So this was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. Look at your gloss again. This was formerly an unfashionable view. That is, it wasn't accepted by the elites, if you want. But now the present age confirms how true it is. What's he saying? A bod, a procurer of flesh, can transform beauty into chastity. That is, it does what? It uses it for kind of the opposite. <coughs> Ophelia. Uh, Hamlet finishes that little speech. I did love you once. Notice the tense that gets emphasized with the adverb at the end. I did once. What's that imply? Now? Not so much. Indeed, my Lord, you made me believe so. She did believe him. Until when? <clears throat> her father? Her brother? You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Okay? Virtue, your footnote, cannot be grafted onto our sinful condition without our retaining some taste of the old stock. What's the old stock he's talking about? Now, your gloss tells you our sinful condition. Use the language that St. Paul uses. The old Adam, as opposed to the new Adam. The old Adam is the Adam in the garden that does what? Falls, sins, and according to St. Augustine, major figure in Western Christianity, why does he fall and sin? It's because of sex. Okay? What are they largely, under the surface, talking about here? They are talking about sex. So, Hamlet says again, You should not have believed me. Why? For virtue cannot so inoculate. What does inoculate mean? <coughs> is it heal? Like kill. Is it kill? It's to protect against. Right? Like when you get an inoculation, a vaccination, it's protecting you against something. Right? So it cannot protect against what? Our old stock. What's he saying about virtue? Let's say capital P. What can it do to the quote-unquote old Adam? The sinful person. Just give some of that relish. The other day, I put over here. What's the T stand for? Total depravity. Total depravity. That is virtuous living, or to put it in the way Calvin would talk about it. cannot do what? Can't wipe away this. This is one of the ways this play is one of the most religious that Shakespeare wrote. He is dealing with the major controversies between Catholicism and Protestantism. Okay? So, virtues, virtue, cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. That is, there is some part of the old Adam, some sinful aspect that will go, okay, I, I can wipe away all my other bad stuff by doing good works, helping people, you know, that kind of stuff. But there's this one part, no, I'm going to hold on to it. Why? Because this is fun. This is the sin I really like kind of a thing. Read The Minister's Black Veil by Nathaniel Hawthorne. You'll see what he's getting at. Okay? So, I loved you not. Well, he said, I did love you once. Now he says, I loved you not. 
Why? Is Hamlet just, you know, yanking her chain? Is he just playing games with her? I think he's trying to, let's use the word he used, inoculate her. I could be wrong. I think he's trying to protect Ophelia. But he can't come right out and say, Ophelia, you're being used. Why not? He doesn't trust her because, are you honest? Why else? Where are Claudius and Polonius? They're hiding behind an heiress, spying. Does Hamlet know they are hiding behind an heiress? We're never told that he knows. But I think Hamlet at this point already realizes he is the observed of all observers. And that there is more going on than Horatio can understand. <laughs> there is more in heaven and earth than is dripped of in your philosophy. So, I loved you not. I was the more deceived. What does she mean the more? Why doesn't she just say, I was deceived? What's the more imply? Okay. I think it's just the opposite. She believed him. I really believed you. That's why she was the more deceived. Remember the sonnet? One forty something when Shakespeare, the speaker, says, you know, I'm like a so and so. I pretend to be a young man. She pretends to be pure. We're both kind of happy, knowing what? I'm old. She's a whore. <laughs> so, I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why? Why go to a nunnery? Well, why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Think of Hamlet's speech to Polonius. Not very much longer before this. Where he says, do you have a daughter? Uh-huh. Keep her out of the sun. Why? Because the sun breeds maggots in a dead dog. Well, breeder of sinners. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest. Look at your gloss. Reasonably <laughs> virtuous. Reasonably virtuous. Can you be reasonably virtuous? Can you be can you be mostly virtuous? Can you I mean, read Ben Franklin's autobiography where he goes in, you know, and he tries to keep a table of his virtuous because he wants to improve himself. You know, this day I did this, and this day I did this, and this day. And he does that, and what does he come to realize? You don't get better by doing that, okay? So, I'm indifferent on us. But yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better than my mother had not borne me. To say, to even give voice to the idea, it were better I had never been born, says the person is thinking what? I want to die. Life is horrible. Life is not worth living. I, for example, he tells us, I am very proud. Pride is, according to most of the categorizations in the medieval church, in Renaissance church, pride is the chief of sins. Why? It's the sin that led Satan to fall. I want to be like God. That's pride, okay? What else is he? Revengeful, ambitious. Well, who says he's revengeful? The ghost commands him to seek revenge. Who says he's ambitious? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern did. Has somebody said he's proud? That is, have we seen Hamlet so far in the play demonstrate any of these characteristics 
demonstrate. Do them, not say them. No, we haven't. With more offense at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in. Imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. Where really are all these things in Hamlet? They're inside. These are, these are quote-unquote sins he's feeling, if you want. What should such fellows as I do? Crawling. Between heaven and earth. Why crawling? Why not standing? Why not reaching? What's he implying about humanity? On the great chain of being, where is humanity? We're more beast like than we are angelic. Or Hamlet is more beast like. Then he is angelic. Okay, what has he already said about this world? He calls it a stale promontory. <clears throat> so what should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves all. What does errant mean? <clears throat> Wandering. What's the difference between wandering and going on a journey? A journey has a destination. Wandering means you're aimless. Wandering means I don't know where I'm going. Wandering means I don't know what my purpose is. See, this is one of the things Hamlet, the play, wrestles with. Why are we here? What's no, big questions. What's the meaning of life? We are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. Okay, Who does the none of us include other than Hamlet? Your father and mother. Can Hamlet come right out and say, don't trust your father. Don't trust your brother. No, he can't do that for a couple of reasons. One, that does what? It pits her against family. Won't work, guys. <laughs> Don't try it. Okay. Two, why else? Well, if he thinks that she's now lined up opposing him, then she'll do what? She'll go back and tell them. Okay. So, get go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? Notice how he just kind of asked that out of the blue. And what does she say? At home, my lord. How did this little thing kind of begin? <laughs> Are you honest? At home, my lord. Liar. <laughs> Let the doors be shut upon him. So, okay, I'll play your little game. If he's at home, close the doors upon him. Why? That he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. So why does Hamlet tell her that? Does she have the power to close the doors on her father in his house? Ah, it's just the other way around. He's got the power to close her up in her house. So why does he say this? I think it's a clue. I could be wrong. I think it's a clue to us, the audience. Hamlet knows exactly what's going on. He knows Polonius is somewhere within the vicinity listening. And what's he doing? Watch out. You don't want to cross me. After all, we're going to hear the king say fairly shortly, madness and great ones unwatched must not go. Hamlet is implying, you're a fool. Stay in your own home. Be a fool. What's the whole upshot or kind of thrust of Polonius's words to Laertes before he goes back off to school? That is, 
What's the point Polonius is trying to make in those Proverbs? Louder? Have discretion. That's a good one. What else? How does he sum it up? To thine own self be true. What does that imply? Is Polonius true to himself? Is he, quote unquote, true to the king? He thinks he is. Ophelia, oh, help him, you sweet heavens. Is she saying, help him, my father? Uh-uh. Why does she cry out to God, help Hamlet? She thinks he's crazy. She's like, what? Why are we talking about my father? Why are we talking about honesty and beauty in the old man and such? Let the, um, he goes on. Okay, if you do marry, if, you do, if you're not going to go off to the nunnery, fine. If you do marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. With, I'll admit, I'm old-fashioned. You know, <coughs> when one of my daughters wants to get married, whoever the guy is, damn well better come to me and ask for my blessing. What is he saying here? Blessing? Curse. We're going to hear Lear next week give some great curses. I mean, Shakespeare just kind of turns on the spigot full bore. He's letting all the anger and ill will out. No, I'll give you this plague. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow. What? Thou shalt not escape calumny. Even if you are as chaste as ice and cold and frigid as the North Pole and as pure as the wind-driven snow, he says what? You won't escape. What's he mean by calumny? A bad reputation. Why? Because in the medieval and renaissance period, women were thought to not be able to be satisfied by one man. Think of that one sonnet about the will. <laughs> okay. Get thee to a nunnery. Why? If she goes off to a nunnery, nobody can say anything about her reputation. Her reputation will be intact, seemingly like her chastity. So, get thee to an honorary, farewell. Or, if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. Why? For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. Monsters? Cuckolds. You put the horns on our head. How? By turning the bedroom door into a revolving door. Okay. Read The Wife of Bath's Tale by Chaucer. <coughs> How does it end? Well, it's not quite how it... Yeah, it is kind of how it ends. The, the lonely old lady gives the rapist knight, you know, an option. I can be old and ugly and foul and poor, but I'll be true to you. I'll be humble and subservient. I'll do everything you want, etc., till death do us part. Or I can be drop-dead gorgeous and sexy and want to have sex all the time, but... There will be a well-beaten path to our front door because of the other men of the neighborhood. You choose. Hamlet is saying, marry a fool. Why? Because a fool is broken off from reality. A fool isn't aware of reality. Lovers, madmen, and poets. Madmen, those are the fools. Go. Go to a nunnery. Quickly. Why quickly? You don't want to be out in the sun too long. <laughs> Heavenly powers, restore him. Has what Hamlet been saying sound like madness? Does it sound like jabberwocky? 
If you're familiar with the Lewis Carroll poem. No. It makes sense. You, you have to dig a little bit. Notice, Hamlet says farewell. Does he turn and leave? Uh-uh. He's not done yet. I have heard of your paintings, too, well enough. Does that mean Ophelia has in her closet a bunch of canvases? Uh-uh. God hath given you one face, and you make yourselves another. The sonnets. The speaker says, you look at me, and I look at that face, and I look at the, uh, those eyes, and they say nothing but love to me, but I know your heart is rare elsewhere. Here, God gives you one face, and what do you do? You call up Mr. Max Factor, and you make another face. You jig, you amble, and you lisp. Got a little footnote there. You prance about frivolously, speak with affected coyness. You put new labels on God's creatures, that is, by your use of cosmetics, and you excuse your affections, affectations on the ground of pretended ignorance, okay? And make your wantonness your ignorance, your wantonness. He doesn't gloss wantonness. Bevington doesn't. Wanton usually implies sexual looseness. John Donne has a poem called The Hymn to God the Father. And he has a line in there, and he says, you know, about these sins that he wallowed in a year. And those sins, if I remember right, the line before says something about wanton. Okay? Well, in that poem, he's talking about, you know, yeah, I did this sin a little bit, I did this sin a little bit, but this sin, yeah, I wallowed in it a score, 20 years. That is, I threw myself into this thing, okay? Wallowing like pigs in muck. You make wantonness your ignorance. That is, you pretend to be ignorant about it. Go. I'll know more on it. That is, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It hath made me mad. Well, she just said, God, restore him. Restore his powers. And Hamlet says, I'm crazy. Why? Well, Polonius' earlier speech, he's mad for love. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. Who's the all but one? Claudius. Claudius. See, and again, I think that's an example where Shakespeare wants us to think. Hamlet knows. Everything that is said here is going to get back to Claudius. Or Claudius is listening. The rest shall keep as they are. Others who are married, they're fine. Go, Hamlet leaves, and Ophelia gives us, Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. Overthrown. Thrown implies what? Well, overthrown. Thrown down. Okay? But where is the mind in the body? It's up here. This is like the throne. It's <coughs> gone. It's knocked off. Okay? Definition of madness. The passions reign. So, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtier soldier scholars, eye, tongue, sword. She is saying, Hamlet is the eye, tongue, sword of the courtier soldier and scholar. He is the model for all these others to try to emulate. He is, you know, Plato's realm of forms and shadows. He's the form of the courtier, the soldier, and the scholar. For Ophelia, Hamlet represents what? He's the perfect man. He is just perfect in every, well, he was perfect in everything. Now, he's bat you know what crazy. 
the expectancy and rows of the fair state. Expectancy? And he's going to become king of Denmark. Uh-uh. That is, everybody put their expectations in him. The glass of fashion and the mold of form. He knew how to dress. His figure, his body type, you know, was what all the men wanted to be and all the women wanted. The observed of all observers. Quite, quite down. Now, that observed of all observers, what is she telling us about Denmark? This is severe depression. Um, okay. How so, though? What does everybody apparently do in Denmark? They're like, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter novels, they're like Petunia Dursley. Always checking and seeing what everybody else is doing. And where is Hamlet in that? Right smack in the middle. Everybody has an eye on Hamlet. And I of ladies most deject and wretched. Why is she most deject and wretched? I loved you once. You shouldn't have believed me. I didn't love you. She's been dejected, rejected, if you will. That's why she is deject. What does that mean? Depressed. Now she's like, yes, he didn't want me. Well, he's crazy too. That's also why she's wretched. That sucked the honey of his music vows. What does that mean, to suck the honey of his music vows? She fell for him, use a fishing metaphor, hook, line, and sinker. I mean, gone. She was totally gone. She was putty in Hamlet's hands. Also tells us something about his honey vows. Whew, Hamlet's a good talker. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason. What? like sweet bells jangled out of tune. See, bells are supposed to make music. They're not supposed to, you know, do that. They're supposed to be pleasing to the ear. Jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, unmatched. Nobody came close to Hamlet. Right. In form and feature. It's almost like Hamlet is the person that nature was working on in Sonnet 20. The man with hues, all hues controlling, he comes into a room and everybody goes, damn, what a gorgeous specimen of humanity, you know. Is what? Blasted with ecstasy. What's an ecstasy? I think I've asked this before. It's an out-of-body experience. Or, in this context, the mind has left the body. Well, that is a definition of madness. Okay. Woe is me. To have seen what I have seen. What's that? Notice the, pet, notice the tense. To have, that's present. What I have seen in the past. Well, what has she seen in the past? Hamlet, how he was. When she sucked the honey out of his music vows. But she doesn't stop there. See what I see. Hamlet to Hamlet. Kind of like what Hamlet says, kind of like, what Hamlet says, Towards the end of that speech, oh, that this too, too sully flesh would melt, when he compares whom to whom? His father, Hamlet Sr., like Hyperion to a satyr. 
Hamlet has fallen from his godlike state to what? If he no longer has reason as his sovereignty, then he is, go back to crawling between earth and heaven, then he's like what? A mere animal. A mere beast. King. Love? No. His affections do not that way tend. Uh-uh. This isn't for love. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul or which his melancholy sits on brood. Now, if his melancholy sits on brood over this thing in his soul, then what is happening to that thing in his soul? What does a hen do when it's sitting on its eggs? Roosting. And? Keeping them warm and ready for them to hatch. So, incubating. So, Hamlet's Soul, his melancholy, is doing what? It's keeping these, whatever this problem is in his soul, warm. It's keeping it alive. Why? Go back to the end of to be or not to be. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch in moment that's what his soul is doing his soul is preparing for an enterprise of great pitch and his melancholy is brooding on that doing what kind of like helping it nurturing it that's why claudius is afraid and i do doubt the hatch and the disclose who will be some danger do doubt means i expect which for to prevent, we're sending Hamlet off to England. Why as far away from me the better? Okay. What do you think, Polonius? Polonius. Good idea. But I still think the cause is he loves Ophelia. It's from neglected love. So, how now, Ophelia? So the king and Polonius come in. They say these lines. Where's Ophelia? She's there on the <coughs> stage. What's she doing? Just standing there looking at clouds. We don't know. But now Polonius addresses her. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. Okay, if they heard it all, they had to be on the stage. So another indication, not a soliloquy. So, my lord, do as you please, but wait until the play and let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. That is, let her play confessor to confess e. Let him get him to spill it all out. And he says, and what will I do? And I'll be placed so please you in the ear of all their comfort. Well, we've just been told Hamlet is the observed of all observers. So now what is Polonius, where is Polonius inserting himself? Between mother and son? Yeah. Kind of a dangerous place to put oneself. But he goes, but if you want to send him to England, yeah, that's a good idea. King. It shall be so. Why? Madness and great ones must not unwatched go. Why is Hamlet a great one? Basic reason. Prince. Future king. So, 3-2. We get Hamlet addressing the players. And we get a pretty long discussion where Hamlet tells the player how to do what? And the only reason I'm spending time on this is because, and I'm not going to spend much time, a couple minutes, is for almost everybody who reads this passage, they're all scholars at least, this is Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare playwright telling his actors, 
Don't screw up my lines with all kinds of wild gesticulation. In other words, I want the emphasis to be where? On my words. This is my play. Don't play with it. Okay, don't mess it up. He says, why? Line 19. For anything so we're done is from the purpose of playing, that is, acting. And what's the purpose of acting? Whose end, both at the first, back in ancient Greece, and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, in the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. So is Hamlet saying... I'm going to use this as an example. Pretend it's a mirror. Is Hamlet saying to, or slash Shakespeare saying, to his audience in sometime 1599 to 1602, England, you do that. Mind your own effing business. Stay out of other people's noses. Is that one of the things that he's doing? Because if the purpose of playing is to hold a mirror up to nature, then people ought to go to plays and see what? See themselves. And if it's a tragedy, Hamlet, say, there but for the grace of God go I. And don't do stupid it. Learn. From these mistakes. That's what Aristotle said the purpose of tragedy was. Sorry. Notice. To show scorn her image. The purpose of satire is not to tear down. The purpose of satire is to build up. How? You satirize a person's foibles and follies. You satirize a person's Foolishness for what purpose? Stop doing that. You look like a fool. Don't be a fool. Be a wise person. Okay? <clears throat> so, Horatio comes in, and let's see here. Now, let's get that. We get the play within the play. So we have our little seating arranged. And Polonius says, you know, I want to play Julius Caesar, etc., etc. And the queen goes, Hamlet, come sit by me, son. Hamlet, no good, mother. Here's metal more attractive. Metal more attractive, like magnet steel. Polonius, you see, I told you. He still loves her. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? And he lies down at Ophelia's feet. No, my lord. Okay, he says, shall I lie in your lap? And Ophelia's kind of like, oh, Hamlet, not in public. <laughs> I mean my head upon your lap. <laughs> Hamlet means this head, but he's punning sexually. I, my lord, do you think I'm in country matters? In the Renaissance, I think I've heard this one before. In the Renaissance, I used to be, um, my dissertation was on the Holy Sonnets of John Donne, and I worked on the very warm edition of the poetry of Donne. One of my duties was I would scroll through microfilms of 17th and late 16th century manuscripts, looking for poems by Donne, and if I found them, I would transcribe them. Almost all the time, when the word country came up, it was spelled this way. Why? It's a visual pun and an oral pun. Right? Also, in the Renaissance, you know, this and this look the same, right? One of them would have that. This little mark is the only thing that makes this an F and not an S. Yeah. In the Tempest, you have a song. There where the bee sucks, suck I. In manuscript form, however, often an F would not have that. 
Shakespeare puns on that that um, peculiarity, if you want, of orthography. Why? As Samuel Johnson said, Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't like. It might be a really, really bad pun, but Shakespeare would run with it as kind of far as he could. So, do you think I meant country matters? Why? Because he's talking about lying in her lap. I think nothing, my lord. Okay. How do you represent nothing? Okay. How do you represent numerically? I hear a couple of chuckles. Why? What's a zero? It's a hole. I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between me maid's legs. That is, nothing. You are merry, my lord. <laughs> in other words, Hamlet. You know, you're in a good mood. I, I. Oh, God, you're only jig maker. What should a man do but me marry? For look you out cheerfully, look at mom. And my father died within two hours. Hey, tis twice two months, my lord. Now, when Hamlet says, it's only been two hours, he's not being literal, right? It's a figure of speech. It's understatement. She's like, no, it's been more than two months. Really? So long? Then let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Died two months ago and not forgotten. Hmm. So we get the play within the play. Okay? And we hear, page 1124, line 234, what do you call the play? The mousetrap. And then he goes on, it's the murder of Gonzago. Okay? We see the poisoning, and notice, in the mime show, what does Hamlet do? Line 259. He gives the running commentary. A poisons him in the garden for the estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant. That is, they didn't make it up. This is an old story. And written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon. The king gets up and leaves. And Hamlet's like, gotcha. Why? Because the plays that we're in play the plays the thing we're in I'll catch the conscience of the king so Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come up to Hamlet and look for this on YouTube or maybe I'll try and find a clip and post it to D2L the Richard Burton um, film that they did of a dress rehearsal it wasn't really a dress rehearsal it was a, it was a rehearsal the film they did in 1964 of Burton as Hamlet and John Gilgut as the ghost and such. This scene in it is just utter brilliance. Okay, Because Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come out, and they start questioning Hamlet, and the players come in, and Hamlet sees the players, and one of the players has, or some of the players have recorders, you know, this kind of recorder. And Hamlet takes one and says, will you play upon this pipe? Line two, no, three, forty-nine. My lord, I cannot. I, I pray you. Believe me, I can't. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. <coughs> well, it is as easy as lying. Hamlet's saying, and you can do that pretty damn well. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth, and look, it will discourse most eloquent music. Try. But these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. And if I remember right, in the Burton version, he knocks the guy on the head with the recorder. Why, look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out of the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And, oh, there is much music. Excellent voice in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak. In other words, and if I wanted to speak, oh, you'd hear a lot. It's blood. Do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me. That is, Going from recorder to guitar, you cannot play upon me. 
And Polonius comes in. Mother wants to speak to you. They all leave. Hamlet gets a soliloquy. Tis now the very witching time of night. Which tells us what? Ghosts ought to be appearing. Fairly soon. And he tells us what happens during the witching time of night. When churchyards on and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. This is an example of Shakespeare bringing in popular folk belief into the play. Now can I drink hot blood? In other words, now I could kill Claudius. But what? Soft now to my mother. O heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. Why? Because Nero killed his mother. I will speak daggers to her. So, 3-3. Three, three. The king says, you guys, you got to take him. <laughs> Guildenstern. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. What a suck up. Who are the many who feed upon his majesty? Well, literally, it's the entire state. But who more specifically is it? No, it's not him. Well, I mean, yes, it is Hamlet. It's the courtiers. It's the Rosencrantzes and Guildensterns, okay, who have their employment from the king. So, Polonius tells the king he's going to his mother's closet. I'll hide behind the heiress, etc. And the king gets a soliloquy. And the king tells us what? Guilty. Do we know up to this point that Claudius actually killed Hamlet Sr.? No, we don't know it. What is the evidence? His reaction at the play, which would be circumstantial, the ghost, which is kind of hearsay. But now we hear it directly from his mouth. Okay? So, some critics have suggested Hamlet doesn't act up until this point. One, he doesn't have proof. Okay? So Hamlet, as the king is speaking, Hamlet walks by and sees him. And he sees the king drop down on his knees, hands in prayer, looking up to heaven. Draws his sword, and then what does Hamlet do? Go back to the end of to be or not to be. He thinks. And thinking does what? Does what? It takes the native hue of resolution and casts a pale look on it. I'll kill him! he's praying. And if he's praying, he'll be forgiven. And if he's forgiven, he'll go to heaven when dad's in purgatory. That's not revenge. So I won't kill him. Now, when will I kill him? When he is drunk, line 89, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. Kind of hard to kill him and not his mother at the same time, but, you know. When he's at game or swearing about some other act that does what? Has no relish of salvation. While he's doing something that cannot possibly construed is leading to his salvation. But prayer? You don't want to kill somebody while they're praying because God will go, well, I forgive you. And Hamlet leaves, and what do we hear? My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts, never to heaven go. Why? What are the thoughts to the words? The honey music. They're the real intention. Right? How many times have we listened to a politician, saw the word, the, the lips move, and known? 
lying through his or her teeth. That is, saying something, but we know the thoughts are not there. So, Hamlet goes up and talks to his mother and says, What's the matter? Line 10. You've, you, you've offended your father. And notice, Shakespeare doesn't have Hamlet go, uh, who? Who? Mother, you have my father much offended. So, thy father, notice the difference between the TH and the Y forms. You have offended thy father, she says. Thou hast offended thy father. Mother, you have my father much offended. Notice, my father. Because... He ain't my father. You answer with an idle tongue. In other words, don't be a smart ass boy. That's what she means. Go, go. You question with a wicked tongue. Ouch. An incestuous tongue. How now, Hamlet? Oh, now what's the matter? Have you forgot me? No. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. All right? So, Hamlet tells her to come sit down. You shall not budge. She says, oh, what would you do? You're not going to murder me, are you? And we hear, what ho, help, behind the heiress. And Hamlet, ugh, does he think? Does he stop and pause? No. This is a, you know, moment of great pitch and expectation, and he just reacts. What hast thou done? I don't know. Is it the king? He's like, please God, please let it be the king. Hamlet. A bloody deed? That is, you call this a bloody deed? Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. Notice what Hamlet suggests in that little line. She was in on it. She did it. I mean, that's the implication. Kill a king? Aye, lady. He discovers Polonius. <clears throat> Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool. When, did, when was the last time we heard Hamlet refer to Polonius as a fool? When he's talking to Ophelia. And he says... Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but is in his own house. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. So, he tells his mother to sit down. And she says, what have I done? And, okay, I'll tell you, Mom. And he talks about her. And he talks about Claudius, and he talks about Hamlet Sr. In fact, he goes over to the nightstand, and he takes a portrait of Hamlet Sr. off, and says, look at this. This was your husband, line 64. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband. Like a mildewed ear. He's not talking this ear, though, that is implied because how did Hamlet Sr. die? He had poison poured in his ear. He's talking like a ear of corn that rots, blasting his wholesome brother. Okay? Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turnst mine eyes into my very soul. And there I see such black and grained spots. Because the soul is supposed to be what? Pure, untainted. And now, does she see a little spot named Claudius? No, multiple spots, as will not leave their taint. And they cannot be blotted out. Hamlet, nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an enseamed bed. 94. Saturated in the grease and filth of passionate lovemaking. And Shakespeare uses in intentionally. 
Why? Because it sounds like in semen. He wants his mother to really get the image. Stewed in corruption. Why stewed? Because stewed has the implication, one, of boiling and cooking over time, but also because of the relationship of the word stewed to the stews, the brothels. Brothled in corruption. Mom, you're a whore, is what he's telling her. Honeying and making love over the nasty sty. You're like a pig in heat with him. Stop. No more. And he just keeps going. I mean, he's on a roll now. He's, it's just letting all that filth and rot out. That's why I said it's kind of like confessor and confessee. He's confessing, you know. So the ghost comes in in his nightgown. Dread you. <laughs> and what does the ghost do? Stop. Leave your mother alone. So Hamlet stops. How is it with you, lady? She goes, how's it with you, Hamlet? Because you're talking to the air. Hamlet. I'm okay. I'm, I'm looking at him. Whom? You don't see anything. No. Nobody's here but us. Ghost leaves. 143. This is the coinage of your brain. Hamlet, you made this. That is, this image that you think. How do we know this isn't the coinage of his brain? Marcellus Bernardo and Horatio all saw it. Okay? Hamlet. <laughs> Ecstasy? That is, you think I'm crazy? Uh-uh, you're not getting off that easy. So he tells her. What he's seen, and she says, Hamlet, uh, no, let me back up. Hamlet says, crazy? Nope, come here, feel my pulse. It's low, it's fine. Confess yourself to heaven, 156. Repent what's past. Repent literally means what? Turn around. That is, turn away from what's past. Well, what's past? The rank and seamed incestuous bed. And do what? Avoid what is to come. Well, what's to come? No. Okay, it could be avoid what's to come, that is, judgment day. But I think he's being a lot more particular and a lot more soon in time. Don't go back to Claudius's bed tonight. That is, you can repent from what's past. It's real easy. Because you can't redo what's past. Right? But repenting what's to come, to turn away from that, that's a bit harder. So, and do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranker. Hamlet does cleft my heart in twain. Psalm 50, Old Testament. God will not despise a broken and contrite heart. She says, my heart is broken. Hamlet, good. Throw away the worser part. That is, the bad part, the old Adam, get rid of that. And do what? Live the pure with the other half. Good night. But don't go to my uncle's bed. Notice he doesn't say, don't go to your husband's bed. He wants to, imp he wants to put in her mind, brother-in-law, not husband. Assume a virtue if you have it not. Well, how can assume, you assume something if you don't, if you don't have it? It's like I posted something on Facebook the other, last night. I was, you know, reading through stuff. Some guy in the Netherlands who's 65, wants to identify as a 46-year-old, wants to quote-unquote self-identify as a 46-year-old. Why? Because his doctors tell him he has the body of a 46-year-old. He wants to do this so that he can hook up with girls via Tinder. Literally, that's what the Guardian article was all about. And I posted, hey, 
if he can do this, then can I self-identify as a 67-year-old so I can go ahead and retire and get Social Security? <laughs> Assume a virtue means what? Put on. Like you're putting on a coat. Act like you are virtuous. Why? Because that monster custom does what? Who all sense doth eat of habits of devil is yet angel in this. That to the use of actions fair and good, he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on. That is a fancy way of saying what? If you're an alcoholic, if you're addicted to nicotine, how do you stop? The patch, gum, etc.? No. Cold turkey. Professor I worked with when I was... Um, PhD student, my major professor, Oki from, or old Oki from Oklahoma, smoked since he was like 12 or 13. He was in his 50s then. And I mean packs a day. And one day he comes into the office and he's just chewing wads of gum. Why? Because he decided he wasn't going to smoke anymore. And he literally stopped smoking that day. So how do you do that? You start being virtuous one thing at a time, Hamlet says. And what happens? So if you stop smoking for one hour, that makes the second hour that much easier, which then makes the third hour that much easier, and then the fourth hour and the fifth hour. So if you stop sleeping with your husband slash brother-in-law tonight, that'll make it easier not to do it tomorrow night. Assume a virtue even if you don't have one. That is, he's implying she wants to go to bed with Claudius. He's not foul and ugly and fat and disgusting. Okay? So, I know what you want to do, but don't do it. Don't give in to that. And he says, refrain tonight, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence. The next more easy. Why? For use almost can change the stamp of nature. Use, habit, can almost inoculate you. Against the old Adam. That's the stamp of nature. Original sin. Shakespeare is getting at the main ideas of the split between the Catholic Church and Protestantism. Good deeds can carry one a long way, he is suggesting. For all use almost can change the stamp of nature. And either something the devil or throw him out with wondrous potency. So, I do repent. He points to Polonius. But heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this, with Polonius, and this with me, that I must be their scourge and minister. Hamlet is saying, heaven has Made me what? The scourge for Polonius. And who does Polonius work for? Claudius. Oh, alas, that I was born to do what? To set time aright. God has appointed me, Hamlet is saying, as a minister of what? Vengeance. I'll bestow him, all will answer well, the death I gave him. So again, good night. I must be cruel, only to be kind. This bad begins and worse remains behind. This bad begins. The bodies are going to start to pile up. Right? Because this is the, other than the death that began before the play began, or the occurred before the play began, this is the first death, first death in the play. How many more are we going to get? Okay, so we have Polonius. Who's next? Next, Ophelia. Who dies before Laertes? Gertrude. Ah, yeah. Rosencrantz and Gil Guildenstern. Gertrude, Laertes, um, Claudius, and Hamlet. I mean, it's kind of like the gate opens and... A lot of people die by the end of the play. 
Okay? So, Hamlet tells his mother, when she says, oh, and you get to go off to London and have a... There's letters sealed. We'll stop with this. And my two schoolfellows whom I will trust as I will, adders fanged. Water moccasins. Rattlesnakes. They bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work. For tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard. And it shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. In other words, and I know exactly what they're doing. I know exactly what Claudius is planning. And what's going to happen? My two schoolfellows are going to what? They're going to die. And then later on, he tells us, via Horatio, through Horatio, or to Horatio, he tells us exactly what happened. Okay? For one, King S. Gertrude, how's Hamlet? Mad as the sea. Crazier and crazy, he killed Polonius. The king says, and if it had been me, I'd have been dead. Okay? For two, we get Hamlet with um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Let's see here. And they ask Hamlet, where is Polonius? Uh, now, we'll have to pick up with 4-2 on Tuesday. We don't have time to get into the whole body the king thing. So, we'll finish on Tuesday, no matter what. <laughs> and maybe get into the first bit of... Um, King Lear, yeah. <clears throat> so I'm trying to sign up for your uh, really one class next semester. Uh -huh. um, do you 